You are tuning in to the Cigar Guys podcast, where aficionados and newcomers alike gather to explore the vast cigar universe. Meet your host, Alexander Gonzalez, Mark Nikolai, his big little brother, Zachary Nikolai, and Jared Burroughs. So, sit back, light up, and let's get the conversation started. All right, thank you guys for tuning in to another episode of the Cigar Guys podcast. We are back in the studio after a quite weeks. a while. It's been a while, for yeah, sure. Yeah, been on the move, but Mark is here with me. How we doing? Of course. Uh, Jared is also here. Always here. Back from Michigan. And we have a few other people joining us via video. We're doing a little uh, special segment here. Uh, essentially, we're doing consumer asks, and we're going to be featuring a special guest from the industry. Some of you will probably recognize this man. But first, I'm going to introduce our consumer guest for this episode. We're going to introduce Gabe, who's over here uh, via audio. So thank you very much for joining us, Gabe. Hello, everyone. I am Gabe. I'm the consumer. Welcome. Welcome to the podcast. <laughs> you are, in fact, the consumer. Thanks so much for joining, man. And we are going to introduce the man of the hour. Uh, this guy, I've been told, knows a thing or two about cigars. He's been in the industry for quite a bit. Uh, but let me introduce you, Steve Saka, the legend. How are you doing today, sir? Uh, I'm a consumer like Gabe, so uh, <laughs> I like Gabe, right? I picked the hottest room in the house, dude. It's, it's blazing here. Oh, it's got to be a, it's got to be ninety seven in here right now. Yeah, yeah today uh, we're in Florida right now, so I mean it's it's brutal down here too. Jared came in, he starts yeah, sweating. A brutal sixty eight degrees, controlled by air conditioning, no doubt. No, I mean. <laughs> <laughs> Our air conditioning is decent, but the Florida heat is going to get through to it. So, uh, but we'll get through it. So we're going to start off first of all by telling everyone what we're smoking. So, Jared, why don't you start? I'm smoking my favorite, uh, Red Meat Lovers. As you can see, I smoke this quite often, maybe once or twice a week. And ever since I started smoking it, actually Mark turned me on to it, actually. Ever since then, I've been kind of addicted to it. Yeah, that's pretty I really cool. like it. Well, great. Thank you for your money. <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome. Mark, what are you smoking? Yeah, so I'm smoking a cigar from 2021, actually. This is the... Don't get mad at me for butchering this because I'm terrible at pronouncing stuff. The Mi Querida... Fino Largo. Close enough. I'm actually offended being an Hispanic myself. <laughs> <laughs> it's uh, First off, you got to watch the old episodes of the Adams Family, because that's what uh, Gomez used to call Patricia, right? Wasn't her name Patricia? And he would call her, her his Mi Querida. Querida. Morticia. K Morticia, right? Morticia, yeah. Morticia, that's what it was, right? Me, just like M-E, K, like K Jewelers. Rita, me K Rita. Me K Rita. Yeah, me K Rita. There we go. <laughs> and then I am smoking, uh, probably Steve's favorite cigar. Uh, the now leave me the hell alone, Lancero. <laughs> I love it this year, man. Sold a lot of those GFY samplers. My God, that's crazy. <laughs> yeah, uh, I, I kept seeing pictures of those all over social media. Uh, I heard it were hit too. I think it was just so quirky that it was kind of like, it's kind of a boring year for a lot of releases. So yeah. I think it was just something that kind of like, okay, well, here's something we can take a picture of and talk about. Fair point. What about you, Gabe? What are you smoking in the swelt box that you're in? Oh, my gosh. This humidity is killing me. Uh, I'm doing beef stick. My local spot here just finally got them. So I was like, I'll go pick up a couple of them for tonight. I'm doing a Sin Compromiso number four right now. Nice. Very nice. That, that is, uh, I almost picked up a Sin Compromiso, but I actually realized that I've never had uh, this size of the Musa de Saka, so I figured now is better than any time to try it. The thing with Muestras, though, it's not just a size thing. It's also a blend thing. So, I mean, they're all different. Right. They're not just the same blend in different cigars. So. so, if you like it, you can't get it again. So, oh, well. But uh, yeah, <laughs> no, no, are we making it a larger or are we making it a smaller? Well, could we make it any smaller, I guess. I guess we could cut it in half, sell it twice. Mm, that's a thought. 
There you go. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so we're going to go ahead and kick it off. And Gabe, I'm going to let you ask the first question for uh, Mr. Saka. All right, I'll shoot from a hip of my giant basket of questions I have here. Uh, okay, dead air. Here we go. All right, I'll just shoot with this one. Uh, what drew you to using Connecticut Broadleaf Tobacco in your blends, and how do you believe it enhances the overall, I guess, smoking experience? Uh, you know, a lot of it is just based on what you want. But yeah, well, that's where it starts from. It. Connecticut Broadleaf has always universally been my favorite, uh, for lack of a better term, New World rapper, right? Um, I just, I like Connecticut Broadleaf. Uh, many of the cigars that I really got hooked into in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, over time, I just seemed to gravitate more towards the Connecticut Broadleaf Wrap Cigars, stuff from uh, the Villazon factory. Uh, back then, you know, Hoya de Monterey and Punches and JR Ultimates and cigars like that. So for me, it was a, it's a flavor thing. The thing I always liked about Broadleaf was it's, uh, it's a very strong taste it's very rich it's got a real heavy earthiness to it but also at the same time it's also inherently sweet so i like that combination of it's robust and it's strong but it's not overly peppery or sharp it has that underlying softness to it that uh, i look at as just a good general trait in smoking tobaccos all the way around so for me it was always my hands down um, my go-to favorite daily i just like connecticut broadly so uh it's one of the reasons why i mean a, a good part of the portfolio that we make today i mean it's not half the portfolio but i mean the entire bk rita family omagog red meat lovers um that all centers around connecticut broadly and uh so it's it's a big part of uh what we do which can be a real challenge because connecticut broadleaf is uh Historically a difficult tobacco. It's one that is always in short supply um, It's only grown in one small region uh, And regretfully, it's probably the most expensive place you could possibly grow tobacco uh, And it's uh, very to the whims of the weather all tobacco is but uh, The weather isn't as I mean so like we have problems like Nicaragua where Maybe the rains will come early or maybe the rains will stay late but there's a general cycle. There's a good window in which you can get crop where, you know, in the valley, you have some summers that are cool. You have other summers that are hot and dry. You have others that are just rainy. You have uh, seasons with tremendous hailstorms. So it's, uh, it's a lot of rolling the dice environmental-wise. And then you've got the other problem in the valley. It's historically uh, it's problematic with blue mold. Which causes another problem. They have a whole bunch of issues that make broadleaf difficult to grow. Um, the problem, though, is every time I've had any sort of broadleaf grown anywhere else, it just doesn't taste the same. Mm -hmm. um, you know, whereas some seeds seem to transplant themselves well in different climates and different areas. But I think I think the broadleaf family it really. It really does best growing in that glacier-fed soil. And you see that with Wisconsin Comstock. You see that with Pennsylvania Seed Leaf. I mean, it's, it's just something about that ecosystem that is ideal for that particular tobacco. And I'm not saying that someone isn't going to, but there's plenty of Connecticut broadleaf seed being grown in other countries now. Mm -hmm. And I'm sure it'll be the next hottest trend on cigars because, well, we tend to make into trends what we have to work with. And there's a lot of this out there now. Um, and you might love it, but I, I just don't think it has that same richness. It definitely doesn't have the same sweetness to me. So for me, it's just, it's one of my favorite rappers. And, and therefore, that's the reason why we make so much use of it and put such a big focus on it. I mean, I mean, we really uh, we kind of go to the mat on that one. And look, we for a company our size, we... We make huge bets on that tobacco, uh, way, way bigger than we should. But it's just so, look, and I'm not saying I'll never run out because I will. 
and eventually I'll hit two, three bad crop years in a row, and I'll just be screwed, and I'll be trying to figure out what the hell to do next. Uh, there's no way around it because I mean, you see, I mean, you see companies like Fuente run out, you see companies like Altidus run out, my father run out, AJ Fernandez. I mean, mm -hmm. every everybody's constantly scrapping. When they yeah. say run out, does that mean like I have not stopped seeing some of those brands that have the Connecticut Broadleaf as a wrapper still coming out? So when they say run out, is that like yeah, they go they go out of stock for a while sometimes. I mean, look, uh, I mean, Robocraft's a perfect example, right? All the Crow mags have now been switched. To, I don't even know what wrapper he switched to, so I don't want to. But I know it, it's no longer. Uh, Crow Mag was connected. Yeah, someone so, someone told me the other day, and I I don't want to say what it is because I'm not too sure either. But I remember someone was telling us that. Um, I wanted to say Mexican San Andreas, but I don't think that's correct. It's something similar though. Yeah, it may be Pennsylvania Sea. I don't know either. Yeah. So look it up. But <laughs> but I mean, I know my father went through a stretch where they had none for quite a few months. I know Dell goes through that same problem. Everybody does. Yeah. And, um, but uh, luckily for me. I bought more than I've needed so far. I'm I'm mm -hmm. keeping up. Okay. But look, there's a, there's a ceiling on it. Yeah. You know, eventually I'm going to hit a point where okay, that's it. So I guess well, one of my questions that I was going to ask, and you may have kind of answered this, um, what are some of the ways that you're able to keep as much inventory of the Connecticut broadleaf that you do? I know you said that you outbid people quite a lot. Uh, are there other ways that you're able to kind of... It's not, quite, it's not really quite outbidding. Um, that isn't really fair. Because outbidding implies that you're kind of like in an auction scenario. It's more about having relationships with the farmers mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. those farmers knowing what you're willing to pay for the right material. Gotcha. And their willingness to grow it, understanding that they don't have to put it into the marketplace and take a risk as to what the price is because here they have a guaranteed customer at a very fair, what the market would consider to be a high price. But I, I, I never look at tobacco that way. I never have. Mm -hmm. uh, to me, it's really irrelevant what something costs. It's a question of what I can turn it into. Mm. And it's a question of what you as consumers are willing to pay for it. So if you weren't willing to pay what it costs, then I wouldn't be able to buy it at the prices that I buy it at. Mm -hmm. Okay. And therefore it wouldn't work. Uh, you know, for many, many years, and there's still quite a few uh, factories and makers that have the mentality of always looking for the most economical when it comes to tobacco, because look, we're in a very tight business. It's a, it's a, it's a pennies business. Um, and, uh, but I've never been price conscious in that way. I've always been from the perspective of, okay, if I buy this for X, what can I turn it into? Can I turn it into something that's worth this amount? If I can turn it into something that's worth this amount, then the price of what I paid for it is irrelevant. It's fair for me. Then the question comes in, well, do the consumers think it's fair? Okay, and if the consumers think it's fair, well, now we have a, ch we have a, a circle, a chain going, then, okay, this works. Um, so how bidding really isn't quite the right way to phrase it gotcha you definitely cleared it up though at the relationship aspect that you have with you know the farms and stuff like that um and i think too uh you were kind of leading into what i believe is the story behind uh the unicorn where you essentially said you went out to make the most expensive cigar cost wise and that's where the yeah. unicorn kind of came from right yeah that's where it came from it came kind of out of spite um i so I've never spent very much time in cigar stores. Mm -hmm. um, you know, in, in my years, in the, as a consumer, I spent some, obviously, and occasionally, but I was never the sales guy. I wasn't visiting shops. And that was, you know, when I was the exec at JR, I wasn't doing that. When I was president and CEO at Drew State, again, yeah, you visit some stores, but it, it wasn't my gig, right? Mm -hmm. So I think when I started Dunbarton, I actually started going into some of these uh, – smaller brick and mortar accounts that I would have just never have had the opportunity to visit. I was really kind of stunned at like some of the crazy prices on some cigars. And I was like, look at these cigars going, why? This is made by so and so. This is this material. Why is this cigar eighty dollars? Why is this cigar this look I always got it why 
Davidoff had Puro Dioro for 500. Mm -hmm. You know, Opus had BBMFs and Padrone had whatever year we're on now, right? I mean, you, you need these Halo products as part of your just overall brand portfolio, right? But none of those companies, they don't look at it as a way to make money. Uh, this is just some little quirky thing that they do on the side that is there to really support the greater image of their company. Hmm. It's there to provide something for, hey, I'm the Opus X guy. I love Opus X. I want to treat myself. I'm going to go out of my way and get, at the time it was a BBMF. I don't even know what the top OPI that's being sought after today. Uh, probably the one that's, I don't even know. Is it an Opus in that in the in the Padron Fuente box? I don't even know. Yeah, What's um, it? yeah, I don't think it's is it technically an Opus or is it um, just a Toro Fuente? But it's so. just a separate cigar yeah, for that. Box. Exactly. Okay, yeah. but, okay, but I mean, so that 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 I understood, right? Because these are companies that aren't they don't try to sell these cigars. They okay? sell themselves almost. Yeah, they're just they're there to be there. Okay, that's that's why they exist. But I was surprised by the number of like. Cigars are like made by like relatively no name people. They just had these like crazy price tags on them. So I started as I was going from store to store, I kept buying them because I was just genuinely curious. And honestly, most of them just kind of sucked. <laughs> okay, they were just kind of like, okay, but it could have been the same cigar for $14, right? Mm -hmm. It was nothing really special. It kind of is like, well, you know, what if you spent. You did everything to the craziest degree, the nth degree. How much could you actually possibly spend? And you have to understand, I mean, when you look at something like a Pro Dioro, I, I don't know how much that packaging costs, but I wouldn't be surprised if they have a penny less than like $100 in just packaging for each individual cigar mm. and the actual cost, right? I mean, so packaging aside, because you can spend boatloads, there's there's tons of boxes in the market today that cost literally seventy to eighty dollars mm -hmm. to make the box cost. I mean, to make these really elaborate boxes, um, and that kind of got me down the rabbit hole. And that's where Unicorn started. And I did them, and when I got to the end of the rainbow and I realized how much it cost, I'm like, "Well, this is stupid. <laughs> no, nobody's ever going to buy these." And so when I got, because my original intent was I was just going to give them away as promos. Like, hey, buy a box of BK Rita and have a unicorn, right, as a free cigar. But the problem was unicorns cost me like $36 a piece to make at mm. the end of a rainbow. I can't afford to hand you $36. I make about $8 to 12 I make I make roughly eh, about 10%. On the wholesale price, let's say the box costs you two hundred, I got a hundred. I make about ten dollars on that purchase, mm. in actual profit. So how can I hand you something that cost me thirty six dollars on something that you just bought that I made ten dollars? Right. right? I, I might as well save myself the work and just hand you a twenty and a half. Use promo items. Give them to the best guys in your shop. Give them to your whales. Do do whatever you want to do with. And I thought that was going to be the end of it. Well, that was like, what? I don't even know, six, seven years ago. And every year, demand for unicorns continues to increase. <laughs> yeah, they are good cigars. We actually buy them for each other for uh, birthdays. Yeah, yeah, they are good cigars. You know, yeah. in the beginning, I was kind of like, like, I don't try to, we still don't actually, right now, we still aren't, we haven't sold unicorns in, I don't know, <clears throat> the last couple, three years, actually. The original ones? No, not even those. We Again, we do the same thing. If you're a good Dunbarton account and you place an order of a certain size in the trade show, here are unicorns. Gotcha. Because we don't give cash discounts. We, we don't do any discounts or any deals or anything like that. So really only our very best accounts get mm -hmm. the unicorns. And it's a way to... Cause I, I've never... I don't know. You, you go down that whole discount road, it never ends. Yeah. Right? And, and it was one of the problems I've struggled with in my previous jobs. It, give this guy this, and then the other guy finds out about it. And he's mm -hmm. upset that you didn't offer him that. So you got to give him something better. So you give him a little better. And then the other guy finds out. You got to give him. And it's just it's like just a road to nowhere. Yeah. And the other thing, too, is so many products are, like, put into the marketplace at this, this artificial price point. Because they, right from the beginning, when most of these cigars, when they release them, 
they already know that they're going to sell maybe for a year or two years at best. And then they're going to end up being uh, bulk discounted at one of the big box stores. So they actually make a cigar that can be sold all the time for six dollars mm. but they just price it for 12. they sell it at the 12 dollar price point for a year year and a half two years if they're lucky and so it runs out of steam and then it just kind of goes into the discount thing yeah 20 percent off then 30 percent off to eventually get to where the price should have been to begin with right so it's just kind of like it's just part of the way our whole industry has gone mm -hmm. rather than just okay this is what it costs to make this is a fair markup. Here it is. Consumer decide is it worth it or not? You know that th those days are long, long gone. I mean, so many products are just price positioned out of the gate high, understanding that they're going to be forty percent to fifty percent off. Because uh, you, you have to ask. It's one thing when it's a closeout or a store doesn't like the brand anymore or something like that. And they say, "Hey, I'm getting rid of this shit. I don't want it." Okay, or I want to fuck that guy or something like that. But when you see a brand that has been at 40 to 50% off for two, three, four, five consecutive years, it's not 50% off. It's just now actually at the right price that it should have always been to mm -hmm. be with because we can't magically make this stuff cost less. The tobacco costs X, mm -hmm. the labor costs Y, the taxes cost this, the packaging costs that. There, there's no there's no world in which you could give like I told you my net margin at the end is like 10 points okay oh uh, how much can I give if my net is 10 mm -hmm. you know what I mean so the whole thing is this just but look consumers love it yeah we love deals yeah. consumers love sales consumers love discounts there's tons of articles written about this whole fallacy of it and how logically it doesn't make any sense but yet we all get drawn in by it mm -hmm. Okay, and we all go, oh, well, yeah, look at what an amazing deal it is. So, I mean, with that logic, uh, Red Meat Lovers $30 cigars so that he can buy them now for 50% off. And then he feels good about himself. <laughs> you know what I mean? It's just, but it's just, it's just such a flim-flam game as far as I'm concerned. Yeah. It's an effective one. Don't get me wrong. It works. And it's just something that I'm at a point in my life that I just don't want to screw with crap like that. I just don't need those sales. Yeah, and we have talked about in the past where a lot of the industry is basically just marketing. A big majority of it is marketing. And that kind of has to do with what you were talking about with these cigars that were outrageously priced for whatever reason. Because, number one, these guys know that there's people out there that will buy cigars just because they are expensive. Because they yeah. want to be seen smoking this cigar. They want you to know that they spent 50 or or $100 on this cigar. Um, and there's a little buy them just because they're on a deal. Right. So yeah, oh this this a uh, hundred dollar cigar is worth you know now fifty dollars because it's on discount. So you feel like you're saving fifty dollars, but like you said, originally it could just been a fifty dollar cigar. Right. Pro, what, pro, yeah, but unicorns, unicorns are a weird beast. I you know in the beginning I didn't really understand why anyone was buying them because look they're good cigars. Don't get me wrong, but is it a good way to spend a hundred dollars? No, there's a lot of better ways to get bang for your dollar on a hundred bucks um but what i come to realize over the years was that people weren't really buying them to smoke they were buying them to use as gifts they were buying them to mark celebratory moments special yeah. moments in their lives something yeah, that's what we were doing <laughs> that's, that, that's what i had come to the realization of and and then you know price isn't as relevant i mean I mean, so, and look, if you're in that super high range of cigars, I think you could do far worse than a unicorn. I think you are, I mean, you are actually getting something that's priced fairly. Problem you have is you have a keystone by the retailer, right, which instantly doubles it. But that's just the way life works. And mm -hmm. look, I don't only really gripes against the retailers because they don't get to make 50% either. The retailers, you know, they have expenses. They got to operate a store. They got to pay employees. They have insurance. Nobody thinks about all the cigars they bought that don't sell. That they got to figure out a way to move. Mm -hmm. So it it isn't like there's a reason why that. Right? The other thing, like most consumers don't think about, is when you look at a retailer today. Like when I was smoking, everything was cash and carry for the most part, right? They might have two folding chairs at the front for the old guys to sit in and smoke out front. 
But now these stores have to have big lounges. I mean, that's a lot of dead space. So they're paying retail dollar for that space that they're renting. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not uh, other than people like Versace and Apple. You can't have mm -hmm. dead space in stores. I mean, uh, every every square foot costs so much, and you need it to turn so many dollars. And so many retailers, when you look at their stores, but 70% of them are like non-money-earning parts of the property. They don't pay less for that square foot. They're paying the same crazy retail rate to be where they are. So I get it. I understand it. Um, but I think uh, unicorns have, and honestly, unicorns right now should actually be about $127. Yeah. I think last time we got them, we paid about 100 yeah. yeah, well, hundreds without taxes. When you go to a tax day, it all gets quirky. But I'm yeah. just saying because of inflation. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. But I haven't raised the price because we don't make any money on them anyways. And I don't know. It just sounds sexier to me that it's $100 than it's $127. So rather than what? So we're making a lot of unicorns now. Way more than we ever made before. We're making like 4000 a year, right? Oh, wow. Yeah. But... 4,000 last year out of 1.8 million cigars. So I raised the price of unicorns that makes it 127. I end up like making an extra, what, $6 a unicorn. You know what I mean? Six yeah. times four is $24,000. You know what I mean? In the grand scheme of things, it doesn't really move the dial anyway, one way or the other. So for me, it's just staying $100 for as long as it can stay $100. I like that. It's, yeah. I don't know. It just sounds cooler to have $100 cigar than $127 cigar. Well, yeah, even so, numbers are always better anyway. It's something about the C note, you know, the whole <laughs> – it reminds me of the cartoon, you know, where the guy's lighting the cigar with a $100 bill. Yeah. I don't know. It just kind of – the whole thing for me works. So, <laughs> <laughs> so what trends do you uh, foresee shaping the future of cigar market? I I don't know. <laughs> do you have like a way of like keeping ahead of it, or you no, just kind of do your own thing? I just do my own thing. Look, I could argue that uh, I've set a lot of trends. I mean, Broadleaf was never used on expensive cigars until I did it at Drew Estate. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I mean, so you're kind of the trendsetter. <laughs> I, mean, uh, I mean, it's just like you know, uh, you know, fancy pigtails. Nobody was using those. Until we started using those, you know, on higher end cigars. I mean, look at all the nomenclature. I kind of like started calling this blue. I started calling this black. Now everybody's got yeah. a blue. Everybody's got a black. I mean, it's kind of look. I, I don't really worry about it. In the end, we're we're selling rolled up weeds in a tube. I mean, there's really nothing genuinely new. Okay, it's, it's pretty much the same basic crap that it was well over a century ago. So this concept of new is really kind of irrelevant. It's just like, it's like fashion. You know, when I was a kid in the 70s, bell bottoms were hot. Then nobody wore bell bottoms. Bell bottoms are out of style. Bell bottoms this. Guess what? We have bell bottoms now. They just call them flare. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> they give it a new name. It's the same shit I was looking at back in 1974, okay, that so <laughs> is dead, that is so now in fashion. You know what I mean? It's kind of like, it's, it's just the way it goes. I mean, and it's the same thing with cigars. It just, it, it just trends. The consumers move. Now, I mean, industry trends, I mean, product trends, I don't know. Industry trends, yeah. I mean, we're going to see more consolidation. We're going to see more corporate ownership. It's not just corporate ownership. It's going to get worse. We're going to see more investor group ownership. Mm -hmm. uh, get further disconnected from the product. Um, and you're going to see much more. And we've kind of gotten into this where I mean, all the big brands, it's all kind of like lifestyle marketed. Uh, you are basically, uh, you, you guys don't even count. You're like enthusiasts. You're cigar geeks. Uh, beyond the little bit of uh, pitter patter that they pay attention to you during trade show time, right? To get their message out, you're so inconsequential to their grand plan. You, you, we're not the consumers, right? They've got us divvied up in all these little boxes: our age, our sex, mm -hmm. our color, our socioeconomic class, our 
are what we want and they're trying to make products to you know oh fit this person and fit that person and fit this person that's it's yeah it's, that's just but i think that's the trend with everything right i i think that's the way it's gone for almost all consumer goods uh, there's a few holdouts in the world that are still just like let me see if i can make a good cigar and hopefully somebody likes yeah. it maybe mm -hmm. they'll buy it because the product is good it's such a novel concept in today's cigar market and i don't think that's going to change but part of that too is because it's so difficult to build the brand there's no value in long-term investment in something because most things uh, consumers today they got basically the attention span of a hamster they're always chasing whatever is the newest, hottest, greatest, whatever. They would rather go from mediocre to mediocre to mediocre as long as it's new. And it's not until they get to be about 50 or so that they start to settle out. And they start to go, why am I fucking around with all this stuff? Here are the you know two or three companies that I really like. Here are the cigars I really like. And then they kind of get into a phase where they get kind of brand loyal and they get kind of cigar loyal. That's why you have things like Padron and you have Fuente and you have uh, Oliva V's and that type of product. But even then, it's a relatively, it's a 20-year window because those brands that are on top and that are filling that need will get replaced by other brands because that's just the way the market cycles. So... I think I think everything about the way things are today, particularly with immediate media, which is good for a guy like me because it lets you get the message out. So you get to introduce your products to a lot more people for a lot less dollars than you ever would. You get to spread your message. But at the same time, that's also what works against you. So it's, it's a catch-22. There's, there's good and bad in it. But, uh, but in the end, it's always going to be the same. It's going to be a market that's really... Eh, probably 19 out of 20 cigars, and probably I'm being generous there, aren't really worth buying or smoking. Right. Not that they're dreadful, not that they're awful. They're just, they burn, they draw, they don't taste offensive, but there isn't much really that makes it attractive. And look, I don't know that that's never not been the case. I mean, it's, it's like everything. It's the same thing with booze, right? I mean, go to a liquor store. How many of those bourbons are really worth like drinking? How many of those yeah. vineyards of bottles of wine? I mean, they're literally just tens of thousands of brands. Do you do you need tens of thousands of brands of wine? Okay, but yet they all exist, uh, and, I, and and I think cigars are no different. No, you bring up a good point with cigars and with what, booze, wine, pretty much any product. There's so many different variations, and a lot of it does have to do with the marketing. But I think uh, for people like us, too, we really do enjoy and we try to focus on buying cigars that we truly enjoy and try to go past the marketing. You know, it's got a really cool band, but it might be a cigar that doesn't taste that great or isn't that great quality. So I think consumers might be trying to look more for what am I enjoying better? For flavor, for consistency, high quality stuff like that. I'm obviously not the anti-marketing guy. Okay, yeah. <laughs> of I mean, course I would not. Never, okay, but what you're hoping is you're hoping to find a company that does a good job at marketing, that also has a good product. Yeah, yeah, and that does occasionally happen. Okay, but a lot of times you get a lot of companies that are good at marketing and the products just kind of blah. Okay. And you get other companies where the product's really good, but the marketing and the branding is so bad that mm -hmm. they never have any opportunity of ever being discovered or getting any sort of uh, any sort of chance in the marketplace. And those exist too. So, but uh, but yeah, I mean, it's uh, it's but it's always been this kind of market. It's always been a market that primarily was decent, okay, and for a lot of consumers, they're fine with that. Look, they smoke. Two cigars a week. You know, they smoke one when they're playing poker on Wednesday night. They smoke one on the golf course Saturday. They just want something that burns well, draws well, doesn't taste like a cat's ass. They're a happy camper. And fits their price point, you know, wherever their budget is. And we're going to take it back here a bit. I mean, and you can attest to this, this industry is definitely 
a very, very interesting industry, very cutthroat sometimes, uh, a lot of complications. But what is your origin story of getting into the industry and what ultimately led you to uh, creating Dunbarton and Trust? Oh, God, that's, that's a boring little story. <laughs> <laughs> Just tell us the interesting parts. <laughs> it, you know, it has been 35 years, almost 40. I just started as a geek cigar consumer. That's it. I mean, you know, started getting on the when I I thought I was the only one because you didn't <laughs> have a way to communicate with other people. I was that freaky guy that was like so into cigars and you know in his local stores, and then you know AOL came into existence on dial up, and then I met like twelve other whack jobs like myself from across the country, and just kind of streamrolled from there. And started the first cigar website back in the day. It's like in the nineties. I was blogging. I was kind of doing what you guys are doing, a little bit differently, obviously. Um, but uh, then, you know, led to my first job in the business, which was working as an exec consultant for JR Cigar. Which, when they got bought out, and I left there, uh, I went to Drew, was president and CEO there. And then, you know, before they got bought out, I decided to leave about a year earlier. And, I'd already been, I don't know, I've been doing 30 plus years at that point. Is that right? You know, go look at a calendar and make sure this is true. It's a lot of years, though. And, um, and then I just kind of wanted to just do something independent, something small, you know, something where I just, no partners, no banks, no opinions of anybody else, mm -hmm. not trying to, not really, look, don't get me wrong, I'm in business. The business has to be successful. I'm not operating as a charitable endeavor. I can just stay home and smoke cigars and be perfectly content. Um, but at the same time, I don't have this like burning desire to like, oh my God, I want to get it to be $100 million and I want to sell it and I want this and I want that. Same time, I'm also old enough to know that I would never say that I never would sell it because that's just a stupid thing to say out loud because you just don't know what the future holds. Mm -hmm. Uh, but I, I just I just wanted to do something that was just wholly independent and just whatever I wanted to do. And that's why Dunbarton Tobacco and Trust got started. And I think, too, um, based on conversations that we've had with other people, whether they're consumers or they're in the industry, um, kind of like you said, once you started doing something that you wanted to do, you're putting out products that you enjoy, um, that you believe are really good. That, tr that does transcend into success because a lot of people, they discover your cigars and they say, wow, these are really unique. These are very high quality and uh, they end up really loving them. And I think that... Well, you end up really disliking them because if you don't share a similar taste profile as myself or a, or a kind of a brand perspective of something that you identify with, then none of my shit's going to work for you. Mm -hmm. So it works both ways, yeah. right? That is true. Yeah. I mean, I don't look and look and this kind of attitude that I have. I mean, I'm kind of cavalier, but I'm not. I mean, I'm super OCD. I'm super perfectionist. Um, I'm really into attention to detail. Uh, it's also not necessarily the best when it comes to like actually selling cigars. You know, it, it look it rubs some retailers the wrong way. You know, and I understand it. I. I, I get it. I appreciate it. But my thing is, I don't tell them how to run their business. Mm -hmm. so, you know, stay out of my fucking business. You don't, you don't have to carry <laughs> the product. You know what I mean? It's not like I'm begging you to buy it. You know? I, I, I'm very grateful for the customers we have, and we try our absolute best to serve them as best as we can. But it's, it's not like I'm, like, you know, dialing for dollars either. Mm -hmm. Yeah. No, you bring up a good point because, um, I mean, we've been in – the restaurant industry and then we've recently gotten to the cigar industry and whether, whatever industry you're in if you're solely folk if your sole focus is to try and sell people y it gets aggravating and at the end of the day we like to work with people that are good to work with that enjoy what we do uh, and we enjoy what they do and i think it makes the whole experience more enjoyable as opposed to just like a job per se it's almost like uh your hobby that you know, at the end of the day, pays pays the bills. 
you know, don't kid yourself. It's a job. There's a lot of magic. <laughs> <laughs> How does it matter what you do? <laughs> that, whole, that whole thing about do what you love and you'll never work a day in your life, that is such a bullshit cliche. <laughs> I agree. That, that's, I mean, it's just, that's not true. Doesn't mean I'd want to change anything. But, right. Uh, yeah. But, you get what I'm saying. Yeah, there's always stress, you know, any, anything you do. If, if there's some, like, 22-year-old that happens to click into this podcast, just throw that piece of advice out the window. <laughs> <laughs> that is so full of crap. It's just not the reality. This is why I'm not a consultant. <laughs> <laughs> so what's your favorite cigar that you make? Uh, that's not fair. I mean, okay, what, what do you find smoking the most? Yeah, that, that that that's where I was gonna go actually. Um, so in regular sober mesa, uh, it was until I stopped making them Cervantes Fino and the uh, Elegante, the Churchill. In brulee, um, in regular brulee, it's probably the Toro, but I really smoke mm -hmm. a lot of the blues. The blues mm -hmm. are pretty much my primary focus in brulee because the like, brulee is on my mild end of the spectrum. So the little bit of kick up that I get out of the blue and the size really works for me personally. Um, in Mi Querida, uh, in the original blue line, primarily Ancho Largos, the Toro, and also the uh, the Gordita, the 4x48. I really like that little cigar a lot. Uh, it smokes just like a Toro, just in miniature. It's one of the things I really like about that 4x48 format. Is it's kind of like a Toro that's just been hit with a shrink ray gun. Um, in Tricky Traca, it's definitely the number six four eight. The, the 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 that that cigar for me just sings. Uh, I really like that. And the black, I smoke both the Saka and the Papa Saka. Um, I smoke more Papa Sakas because of the time uh, than a Saka yeah. Con, but uh, but I I enjoy both equally, even though same blend, but obviously the size has a tremendous impact. Of course, the blend slightly adjusts to accommodate the sizes, but but I, I, I like the Papa Saka a lot. In Muestra de Saka, Naka Tamale. Naka Tamale has been my favorite Muestra since Jump. And then typically, I'm like consumers. Whatever is the newest one, I tend mm -hmm. to smoke more of those, right? So Naka Tamale is the only one that kind of like breaks, but like I'm smoking a lot of Krakatoa right now. Uh, a year before, a year and a half ago, I was smoking a lot of Bewitched. I still smoke. I have to smoke everything, right, for quality yeah, control. Yeah, yeah. But, but Naka Tamale is the one that I always drift back to. I, there's just something about that cigar that I just I really, really like Naka Tamale. Sin Compromiso, it had been the number five in the Paladin. The Paladin, though, is a problem for me because it just, again, it's such a, I don't tend to like to smoke Sins when I'm working. I feel like I'm wasting them mm. because it's this medium cigar. It's got a lot of richness and nuance to it. And it's one of these cigars that if I don't focus on, I feel like I'm missing a lot of what makes the Sin such a great cigar. Whereas, you know, if I have an Omegog Toro, I can light it, let it go out, light it, let it go out, chew on it, drop it, <laughs> pick it up. You know what I mean? Yeah, it's not yeah. the With a Sin, I feel like I need to... I need to give it the time it deserves. So I was smoking primarily number fives and Intrepidos, but oddly enough, I really like this Robusto. I, I think the Robusto turned out really good, which is unusual because you notice that it's the first time I mentioned a Robusto out of all the sizes before. I mean, Robusto is not a common size that I smoke on the regular. Um, in uh, the Red Meat Lovers, I'm torn between the Beef Stick and again, the Robusto, the Filet. Um, I like both of those. But I tend to smoke more uh, Mi Querida than Red Meat Lovers. Um, I don't know. Well, part of the reason why is we just don't have enough Red Meat Lovers. We're just so jacked up behind. I kind of feel bad smoking more than I have to. <laughs> yeah, that is a great cigar. You know, so that's a bit of a problem. And of course, you know, you know, get all the exclusives. You know, you get the two versions of Don Derma, and I got U Boat, Barba Maria, and you know, Frog Juice. I have a lot of choices. How's uh, that Barba coming out? I'm guessing you tried yeah, Barba Maria, that's coming yeah. out. I mean, it's in a container now. I don't know what the status is on the container, but I need to ask that more. I mean, sure. I meant, uh, like, like, how, like, is it 
same as last year, or is it? Yeah, well, I mean, it's obviously going to be a little different. It's like that's the thing when you make these cigars in batches, they're never as consistent as when you make it continually. Mm -hmm. When you're making a cigar on a continual basis, you're constantly adjusting the tobacco. Right to to tweak it because look the tobacco is never the same. It's not crop to crop. It's not even bale to bale. Sometimes it's sometimes literally hand to hand. So you're always constantly like micro tweaking. So even if the blend is the same, when it's separated from a batch production, it's never the same. No matter what you do, and you'll get some that'll be better years and other years and it won't be as good. I thought last year's Barbara Amarillo was particularly good. I think, awesome. this year, I think this year's Barbara Amaria is going to be there also. I, I, I feel pretty confident about it. Um, is it like a different section of the factory that does, that just focuses on those store exclusives rather than the... No, like it's the just, uh, no, it's certain pairs. That, well, first off, in both factories, there's dedicated pairs that just make our brands. So if you were to go to Hoya, there are people that just make Sober Mesa, people that just make you know, obviously, Unicorn, there's only one pair that makes Unicorn to work for you. But, I mean, there are people that are dedicated to just making our products. And then of those people, we then tend to choose the ones that make the most sense depending on what the blend and the size is. So in the case of something like a Barba Amaria, uh, that would be somebody that's already making a ring gauge that's similar to that. Okay? Because it's really tough to take someone that's used to making Toros and say, oh, here, I want you to make a Cuban Corona Gorda. They won't typically do as good a job. I and mean, it's one of the reasons why things tend to be so consistent for us being a small company is because we don't order things in batches. We don't stop and start production. They are making all of these SKUs all the time, every day. So what ends up happening is a pair will end up staying on a blend on a size for a very, very long time. You know, yeah, it's one thing to take the person that's making the five by fifty-two robustos and have them make six by fifty-twos of the same blend. That's not a problem. But you can't take the six by fifty-two pair and say, "Hey, I want you to start making Fino Largos that are six by forty-eight and expect to get good results." Okay, because they, you won't. So the the key to making the most consistent cigars is being consistent with the utilization of your labor. I mean, they like to stay on the same blend, making the same sizes continually. Now, in every factory, you'll get a few, like, peculiar pairs that like the variety. They like the challenge. They like to bounce around. Okay, but those are very, very rare. And I will ask, too, um, a question for Gabe real quick. What are, um, like, two or three of the cigars from Dunbarton that you find yourself smoking uh, the most? Uh, that would be... Papa Saka can't stop smoking it ever since it came out. Uh, for the wallet, Umagog, any size of those. I haven't had the bronze back yet, but uh, real big into those. And then when I splurge, it's the Bewitched. <clears throat> Bewitched is a weird one, isn't it? It's awesome. Because oh, my gosh. The thing is with the Bewitched is there's like no discerning taste notes. You know what I mean? It's like like, if I try to write down what does a bewitch taste like, it's just kind of a little coffee, a little caramel, a little this, a little that, slight woodsy, a little spicy, a little... It's not like it's not like I can say, okay, smoke me, Kirita. Robust, rich, earthy, inherently sweet, uh, a bit of pepper spice, but not overwhelming. I mean, I can give you, like, a real flavor description, right? For a, but a bewitched, I can't. But there's just something about that blend that just works. It just tastes good. It's a little of everything that works. <laughs> it's a it's it's a weird one. It really is. I love it. And two, we've got um, a couple questions that came in from some of the viewers that were they were curious about where the whole uh, Sasquatch thing came from. Yeah. So you know how nicknames work. You don't get to give them to your yourself they have to yeah you have to get them from people and i've had a few over the years um, a few cool ones and a few you know kind of like shithead ones <laughs> that, uh, don't we'll name any cigars after those but uh it was when i was working at jr cigar so i was the person that would go to honduras and nicaragua and the dominican republic to follow up on projects that we were doing with various manufacturers 
But when I was in the country, I would go to the corporate offices, which were in Whippany, New Jersey. Mm-hmm. But I didn't live in New Jersey because I was unwilling to pay New Jersey taxes yeah. or mm-hmm. with New Jersey gun laws. So I still lived in New Hampshire. So I would drive down on a Monday and spend, you know, Monday afternoon in the office and, you know, do my week there. I had like a corporate condo thing. And then, you know, Friday around 3 o'clock, I'd like get in the car and try to beat the traffic getting out of the New York, New Jersey area. And I got in the truck one day and I was smoking a cigar and I realized I forgot my cigars on the desk. So now I got to drive, you know, five, six hours to go to New Hampshire and have no cigars. I can't drive without a cigar. Man. Yeah, that's my, a rough trip. My truck is a rolling ashtray. <laughs> so this <laughs> was space. <laughs> right. So oh, what do I do? I like start like trying to find a local cigar store. Oh, I found one. My tent was, I was going to pop in, buy a handful of cigars, get back in my truck and go by my way. So I find this store in northern Jersey and uh, walk in. The store's out of business now. Uh, I walk in the door and a guy just looks at me and goes, Steve Saka? <laughs> Man, it's like seeing Sasquatch in my store. <laughs> <laughs> and I ended up hanging out and smoked like a Robusto and then got on my way. And, there, and then, you know, every three, four, five weeks, whenever I was in town and I had to make that trip, I made a point of stopping at that shop. And his regulars that were there on a Friday they just started calling me Saka Squatch. And that's where Saka Squatch came from. Hmm. Very interesting. And I just lit up the um, one of your newest editions, the uh, Polpetta. Uh, the second Polpetta. time having it, and it's a pretty pretty good cigar. Definitely great for you know a quick a little, rough, a little rustic around the edges. It's not uh, not what I call one of my smoother blends, but. Uh, a lot, it's a lot of pop for the buck, that's for sure. I thought that was more of a time-conscious cigar, so I tried to smoke it on my way to work, and I was almost late because I had like a 45-minute drive. I'm like, this is taking longer than 45 <laughs> minutes. It's really quite amazing that if you if you know what you're doing, how you can actually take mixed filler like that and actually bunch it in a way that it burns and lasts that way. I mean, it's kind of crazy that... Uh, Oh, I was just late. I just showed up late. Like, I'm not putting it out. Because, <laughs> I mean, everything about, the, everything about the size and the fact that it's mixed, Bill, you'd be like, well, this this is going to be, what, 20 minutes? That's what I thought. Nah. You, you, can, you, get, you get 40 plus minutes out of that cigar. For sure. I think it's pretty good. I, I like to smoke it as my, like, second or third cigar of the day. Um, and then it kind of mellows out for me. And it's got... Uh, some unique, I find like a unique cocoa flavor on it. Well, look, it's it's all the table trimmings from all those broadleaf brands made of Noxa. So there's there's Obagog in it, there's BK Rita in it, there's mm-hmm. Red Meat Lovers now in it. Now, it's not everything just thrown in there. We take all the, the table trimmings and we sort them out. Okay, we only use specific ones, but so there is a blend to it. So there is a, a level of consistency. Yeah. But the, if you like the whole that broadleaf universe of those other cigars, then Popetta's is probably going to be in your wheelhouse. The only negative is because of the size, it's going to tend to smoke a little, a little bit spicier than a lot of them. It's not going to smoke as spicy as a Tricky Chaco 448. Because I mean that one's built to smoke, you know, quite peppery. But but it's definitely, uh, it's definitely, it's not as mellow as some of the others. For sure, yeah. Uh, Gabe, uh, next question that you got on your list, you can go ahead and fire. Oh, well, we're going to go back into some more tobacco talk here. Uh, I never know how this kind of stuff works because I don't know how much stuff is a secret or what stuff is that you're just, know, just ask the question. If I don't want to tell you, I won't. <laughs> so, cool. Can you highlight on any innovative techniques or practices that you have implemented in your tobacco cultivation Fermentation or just cigar production in general? Yeah. Anything that's like a sock twist. No, I'm not answering that. <laughs> that's what can't give away his trade secrets. <laughs> you know, I didn't know if there was anything that can be said. Look, everybody has their own little quirks, right? Things they do. I mean, we have slightly different bunching techniques. Even the way we make pulpetta is unique. I mean, there's tons of people that make mixed fill sandwich cigars. 
I mean, you guys have probably smoked a bunch of them over your lives. I mean, how many of them hold an ash like that? Right. How many of them are firm like that? You know what I mean? So, you know, there there are little things that, that we're doing. Um, you know, have I reinvented the wheel? No, I haven't reinvented the wheel. Have I found a way to age my Connecticut shade wrapper that lets the sweetness come out better? Yeah, I have. Um, you know, have I have I found a way to, you know, get the consistency on the structure of the veins on the Connecticut broadly? Yeah, we have. You know, there, there are things. I mean, as there, how, why is it that our cigars are rock hard, but they draw? I mean, it's look. It's one of the things that if you're a cons if you're a new consumer to Dunbar and you've smoked all the brands in the marketplace, or you've been playing around, you pick up one of our cigars, and you're not familiar with our brand. It's kind of scary because none of our cigars feel like they're going to draw. I mean, they are really hard cigars. I mean, I mean, they're very firmly packed. I mean, uh, an average Dunbarton Toro weighs about three grams more than the same cigar made at other factories mm. in a Toro format. You know what I mean? And it's because we have a certain way that we're doing the positioning, a certain way that we're doing the bunching. And what I like about that is I like that denseness because that's what slows the burn down. And when it slows the burn down, it also means that it smokes cooler. And when it smokes a little cooler, it also means you get less bite. And when you get less bite, that's less sharpness. And less bite and less sharpness means I can taste the flavor of the tobacco better. It also means that you tend to get a more even burn, you know, when you slow it down a bit. So, I mean, there's things that we're doing that are unique to the way that we're manufacturing these cigars. Some of these techniques uh, started doing when I was at Drew Estate. Other things we have improved. I mean, Popetta, uh, Papa's Fritas was the very first time anyone had taken, you know, these, you know, really high quality trimmings and said, hey, why are we dumping these into our cheap bulk cigars, you know, into these cheap bundle cigars and these Cuban sandwiches that it just all gets lost? Why don't we start sifting this material out, using it to make a better quality one? But, I mean, you, you can see that that even that construction technique has evolved from what we were doing. Because when we did Papa's Fritas at the time, and I don't know where Drew is now. They, who knows what they can do today. But when we originally came up with it, we couldn't make anything bigger than a 44 ring gauge. That's why Papa Fritas were a 44 ring gauge. 44? Yeah, they were 44. 4 by 44s. You know what I mean? Because we couldn't, you know, get so big, it would start to pit, and it would start to burn really uneven, and the ash would start going all over the place. The technique that we're using on Popetta, I, I can actually make like a like a 50, 52 ring gauge cigar. Hmm. I mean, it's kind of crazy what we can do now with that. So, yeah, but my attitude is if somebody wants to know those things, that's why they have to pull out their checkbook. <laughs> Duly noted. I will erase that question. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. In other words, what you're saying is that there's going to be a bigger size of the palpetta coming out soon. <laughs> I, don't know, I, don't know, I don't know where it fits price point-wise. Yeah. You know, so that's the other thing you have to ask yourself. You know, as look, it makes so many blends. Did Umagog start as one blend as well? Like, that's yeah, Umagogs Umba Umba are a little variable. So what Umagogs are made out of is Umagogs are basically the binder's identical to me, Rita. Yeah. The wrapper's identical, but it's the less aesthetically pleasing wrapper. Okay. Yeah, what, were we, we were, what were we talking about? I even lost track. You know, it's actually, uh, it's funny. We just got cut out for a second. So. Yeah, we lost internet <laughs> and everything. <laughs> Oh, we paused, kind of. Okay, yeah. yeah. I, don't, I don't okay. remember what the question was. What was the question? Something about you telling us your secrets and yeah, you were, you were sharing all the secrets. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it was about you know making a larger popetta. I mean, part of the problem you have to understand is I probably have I probably have right now finished probably like thirty really good ligas. That we have them put in a box. Turn that off. But you can't put everything in a box. You can't sell everything. You only have so much bandwidth. I mean, I, I think I think I actually kind of almost I, I do too much already. I mean, it's a, it's just astonishing the amount of stuff that when you think about how small we are, 
that you know we are constantly doing all these little things and so yeah the fact that can make a popetta bigger doesn't mean that there's commercial bandwidth to put a popetta mm. that's a bigger popetta you know look it made sense financially to do the small popetta because uh, that part i've always found very it's probably the most fun part of the job is you know sourcing tobacco selecting tobaccos putting together blends and doing that and then cigar smokers i mean look I'm a cigar smoker. I mean, there's a lot of people in the cigar business that they're not really like super cigar geek, geeky. You know what I mean? Mm-hmm. You know, and uh, so you know that, that that's that's the part that I've always enjoyed. And I like, and I like, and I think the thing I like is I like I like teaching people. You know, sharing what I know. I don't think teaching is probably the right way to say it, but you know, sharing whatever knowledge I have, other than my personal secrets. But other than that, mm-hmm. yeah, I, mean, I tried. I tried. Mm-hmm. I mean, but, uh, <laughs> yeah, I mean, I mean it, 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 you know, like a lot of what I end up talking about on podcasts, obviously, is a lot of business kind of stuff. And I'm always, I'm always surprised by so many of these uh, small companies that it just if they would just pay attention, they could learn so much and avoid so many mistakes. But they never do so, and it's good. Because one of the things I learned a long time ago is uh, uh, to be the best just means you have to be better than the other people. It doesn't mean you actually have to be. You know what I mean? You're you're an expert if you know two things more than the guy next to you, basically. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So, <laughs> <laughs> so, but, uh, but yeah, I those are the two things I enjoy the most: the tobacco side, the blending side, then just people. Well, yeah, it's like they say, uh, you don't have to be faster than the bear. You got to be faster than the guy next to you. Right. Got to outrun the guy next to you. Oh, yeah. Well, I ain't doing that, so I'm fine. <laughs> <laughs> so, okay, we're going to go ahead and uh, wrap it up. And um, I did want to ask you uh, kind of a final question, kind of uh, give you a chance to share your final thoughts with what you hope your consumers um, take out of you know, smoking your cigars, essentially. I hope it takes satisfaction, enjoyment out of it. I mean, that is the goal, right? Yeah. I mean, ultimately what you want is you want, you want your, you want the people that patronize your brand to actually be satisfied with their purchase, that they feel as though their money was well spent, even more than their money, their time, because time is the most valuable thing. You only get so much time to relax and enjoy yourself. So you're hoping that they find it to be a pleasurable experience and that it adds some value to their life. I mean, that's that's essentially it. It's what it comes down to. Very good point. And I will say that, I mean, us, and I know there's plenty of other consumers out there, uh, cigar enthusiasts out there that enjoy these cigars. It's a fantastic brand. And uh, I do appreciate Steve for joining us this evening and bearing with us for the technical difficulties and Gabe as well. Thank you so much for being here. I actually um, find them quite entertaining. You, you have, it's the same you could record a, a smother hawking you, uh, you know, when you were off about what a, what a big pony show this was. <laughs> that was <laughs> awesome. Are you, are you awesome. located out of Miami? No, we're in Orlando. You're in Orlando. Okay. I got you, the state right. Yeah, you got the state. You, you did better than me. So what, you just got thunderstorms going on? I don't know what's going on, but it was funny when we cut out. We were just saying, of course, we never have any issues like this, and then we have, you know, the Steve Saka on, and of course, the internet's got to go out, the power's <laughs> got to go out, but <laughs> they don't want us to release this episode. <laughs> Jinxed. <laughs> like in the Brady Bunch. What was that little tiki statue? Heck <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah. Well, yeah again thank you guys for both being here thank you for bearing with us and thank you guys for tuning into another episode of the cigar guys podcast and we'll see you next time take it easy we hope you enjoyed this episode of the cigar guys podcast make sure you subscribe and hit that notification bell so you can stay up to date with all the latest episodes looking for short form content check out all our social media accounts in the description below This is titillating podcasting, man.
I can already see why this show is number one. <laughs> <laughs> You're exactly right. It's because of the blooper reels after. 